And I got you your pointer. Oh, cool. Just published a special issue on Hispanic and Mexican. What? Some of the papers have to be This is a conference we did in Austin two years ago. Okay. Oh, and excellent. You will see some people in the Just published. Just published. Oh, excellent. Oh, thank you very much. Now we have thank a book. Press. The papers from the conference we did. Thanks. Thank you very, very much. Uh, so all you need to do is press this. Bueno. Oh, very good. So, uh, bueno, pues vamos a comenzar eh, la, eh, nuestra sesión eh, y pues quiero comenzar por darles... Eh, y no, está bien. Eh, decía que vamos a comenzar esta, esta sesión. Quiero comenzar por darles eh, la bienvenida y bueno, pues agradecerles el estarnos acompañando en esta octava sesión del Seminario Permanente sobre Migración Internacional eh, del ciclo do, eh, 2011 desde el Colegio de México. Eh, este seminario, como, eh, como algunos de ustedes sabrán, se ha venido organizando desde 1998 y pues desde eh, a través de los años de eh, pues diferentes instituciones han col venido colaborando en, en este esfuerzo. Eh, en esta ocasión pues le toca al Colegio de México eh, organizar este seminario y estamos muy muy contentos de tener la presencia del doctor Quiriaco Marquídez eh, con nosotros para a venir a hablarnos sobre eh, los eh, latinos en, en Estados Unidos, eh, en particular sobre la paradoja hispana, eh, envejecimiento, mortalidad y salud en los Estados Unidos. Y bueno, pues quiero también empezar por agradecer la presencia de quienes están en la sala y ta también de las personas que se encuentran eh, en las sedes de las instituciones que colaboran con nosotros en este seminario y que nos van a venir de, acompañando por videoconferencia en el Colegio de la Frontera Norte, en el Colegio de Michoacán, en el Colegio de la Frontera Sur, en Ciesas y en el Colegio de San Luis. Y bueno, da, así como aquellos que nos van, se van a, a seguir el seminario por internet a través del portal del de Colegio de la Frontera Norte. Eh, Decía que para mí es un honor el, el contar con la, con la presencia del, eh, del doctor Quiriacos Marquídez, eh, quien va a hacer una presentación de, de 40 minutos, ya lo explicará eh, también, eh, pues eh, un placer del poder eh, tener eh, al doctor maestro Manuel Ángel Castillo, quien va a estar moderando la sesión, y eh, al doctor César González, quien estará eh, comentando el la presentación del doctor Marquídez. Eh, para aquellos, eh, todos ustedes, eh, les comento, la presentación será en inglés. Eh, tendremos los comentarios del doctor eh, César González en inglés, pero podremos tomar las, 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 las preguntas y comentarios en español. Entonces, eh, pues con eso nos dejo eh, con... Eh, el maestro eh, Manuel Ángel Castillo, quien estará platicándonos un poco sobre la trayectoria del, 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 del doctor Marquídez y moderando la, la sesión para que podamos comenzar con nuestra sesión. Gracias. Gracias, Estela, y gracias por la invitación para moderar esta sesión del Seminario Permanente sobre Migración Internacional, en el que, como ya ella indicó, tenemos como conferencista al doctor Quiriacos Marquídez, quien recibió su doctorado en Sociología en la Universidad de Louisiana State y actualmente tiene el título de profesor distinguido en envejecimiento Annie and John Nitzinger en el Departamento de Medicina Preventiva y Salud Comunitaria de la Universidad de Texas, su Medical Branch en Galveston, donde también es director de la División de Ciencias Sociomédicas. El doctor Marquídez es el editor de la revista Journal of Aging and Health, la que se fundó en 1989. Además, es autor y coautor de más de 300 publicaciones, la mayoría de las cuales versan sobre temas de envejecimiento y salud en las poblaciones mexicoamericanas, así como sobre el envejecimiento 
de las minorías en general. Su investigación ha estado financiada de forma continua por los Institutos Nacionales de Salud desde 1980. Actualmente es el investigador principal de la EPC Hispana, que es un estudio longitudinal de salud que comprende a 3.952 mexicoamericanos mayores de los cinco estados del sudoeste de Estados Unidos. Al doctor Marquides se le acredita la acuñación del término paradoja epidemiológica hispana junto con el doctor Corey, que es uno de los temas de investigación más populares en el área de salud. También es el editor de la Encyclopedia of Health and Aging, publicada por Sage Publications en 2007. El Instituto para la Información Científica ha listado al doctor Marquides entre los científicos sociales más citados en el mundo. Recibió en 2006 el premio de mentor distinguido de la Sociedad Gerontolo Gerontológica de América. Y en 2009 de California, en Los Ángeles. Además fue el primero en recibir el premio Permain del Royal Institute of Aging de la Universidad del Sur de California por su servicio sobresaliente en el campo del envejecimiento, el cual le fue otorgado en febrero del 2010. La presentación del doctor Marquides se titula La paradoja latina hispana sobre envejecimiento, mortalidad y salud en Estados Unidos. Esta presentación ofrece una revisión de la literatura reciente desde el 2005 sobre la paradoja epidemiológica hispana latina en la que se encuentra que la mayoría de los hispanos que viven en Estados Unidos tienen relativamente buenas condiciones de salud a pesar de tener un estatus socioeconómico menor. La evidencia reciente ha sugerido que hay un sesgo del salmón o de la migración de retorno a su país de origen de los migrantes mayores que se encuentran en condiciones de salud menos favorecidas. Sin embargo, este es todavía muy pequeño como para explicar la ventaja en mortalidad de esta población. Otras investigaciones se han enfocado en la mortalidad infantil con datos del Estudio Nacional sobre Salud y Envejecimiento en México en ASEM que el menor diferencial socioeconómico de la mortalidad entre los hispanos, la declaración de etnicidad en los certificados médicos, la influencia de los enclaves de migrantes y las diferencias en los perfiles biológicos. Se ha concluido que la selectividad migratoria de personas sanas sigue siendo la explicación más viable y que también está presente entre la mayoría de grupos de inmigrantes en Estados Unidos, así como en Canadá y Australia. La paradoja hispana es principalmente un fenómeno de origen mexicano. A pesar de su menor mortalidad, los mexicoamericanos viejos están más discapacitados que los viejos en la población general. Los datos del Hispanic Established Population for the Epidemiological Study of the Elderly han mostrado aumentos recientes en la discapacidad entre los mexicoamericanos de 75 años y más. Y eh, finalmente se hacen sugerencias para investigaciones futuras. Well, we thank Dr. Marquides for being with us. You're welcome, and please, you have the floor. I will get up and uh, okay, I'll do this. I'll speak loud. It, because of the broadcast. Okay. Let's hope that I. Well, thank you for the nice introductions, and um, thank you to Estela, especially for inviting me to come and speak to you. Uh, I was in this building in 1985 <laughs> for half a day on my way to uh, better um, to Cuernavaca and, and another meeting, uh, but. Uh, I have been conducting research on aging, um, especially on the Mexican-American Hispanic population of the United States since 1976. A long time, a number of studies. More recently, we have had a very large study, an epidemiologic study that's been going on since the early 90s, still going on, and I will speak about that toward the end. In the beginning, I want to discuss this concept of the Hispanic paradox or Latino paradox, and, uh, and, and because it's like a, it's such a major theme in, in the health of the Hispanic population, 
and and in aging. And, and what we have uh, to simply put it in in advance is a long living population. The Hispanic population in the United States has life. Uh, high life expectancy, perhaps higher than the general population, and uh, and but at the same time, by the time uh, Mexican Americans and other Hispanics, but especially Mexican Americans who are two thirds of the Hispanic population, become old, they become more disabled. They have more health problems, and and, and therefore more dependent on their families for caregiving and so on. But let me begin by, uh, oh, yes, by discussing the, the, the Hispanic paradox. Let me tell you before I go to this original paper that we published years ago, that the Hispanic population of the United States now is over 50 million people, right? Two thirds of them are from Mexico. Mexican origin. The others are Cuban, Puerto Rican, Central and South America, and, and, and some other origins. Now, it's a very rapidly growing population. 50 million is like almost half the population of Mexico. And, uh, and it's growing rapidly. It's growing through high fertility and high immigration. Now, immigration may be slowing down right now because of the economic crisis, but uh, it remains to be seen what's going to happen in the future. By, by every projection, we expect Hispanics in the United States to be about 120 million in 2050, and that's about 30% of the United States population. So what you're looking at uh, in the southwestern United States, especially from Texas, New Mexico, um, Arizona, California, uh, it's the beginning of Latin America. <laughs> And it will be more, more and more uh, similar to Latin America than to the rest of the United States. Now, back in the mid 80s, when we looked at the literature on the health of the population, uh, something paradoxical uh, appeared is that Hispanics, except for the Cuban uh, Americans, they were generally a socioeconomic disadvantaged population, which is still the case on the average. Uh, but they have favorable overall mortality rates. And at the same time, at that time, basically the mortality rates were similar to the non-Hispanic white, to the Anglo uh, rates. It was still paradoxical because of the socioeconomic disadvantage of the population. Uh, so uh, things look better than they should have been based on what we know about socioeconomic conditions, poverty, and how these factors influence uh, health and mortality. So this favorable mortality and health profile was paradoxical, and uh, it didn't really make sense uh, because of the poor socioeconomic uh, situation, but also because high rates of diabetes in Hispanics, and primarily Mexican American, uh, high rates of obesity, Hypertension, cholesterol, these things were, were really kind of uh, the same. Smoking rates among men were going up. They were still a little lower. And of course, women, their smoking rates were much lower. And uh, the alcohol consumption, there may be, there was some high alcohol drinking among men. Uh, the kind of binge drinking, which where you drink once a week, but not, not as frequently, but heavy, heavy. Uh, but that's a bunch among women, and women seem to be uh, consuming alcohol as they become more acculturated into the American society and they become more like other women. Now, another reason why this is paradoxical, the population, when they get older, they become less physically active, and, and we see that in a lot of populations uh, of immigrant groups or lower socioeconomic uh, uh, backgrounds that people work hard all their life. When they get older, they they earn their leisure. <laughs> They're not very physically active. They do not exercise. And that's not a very good thing, especially for diabetics. Uh, what we know about diabetes is that uh, physical activity is really important. 
uh, to prevent complications and, and, and the negative consequences of diabetes, which are very, very severe, including uh, mortality from stroke and heart disease and, and, and so on. Uh, another reason people talked about how do we explain this good news here? Well, we always talk about Hispanics and other minority groups uh, and ethnic populations that have strong families. So strong families provide a support to the individual and might contribute to better health and longevity. Now, my best explanation at the time uh, was that it was migration selection. Uh, people who move from one country to another, they tend to be healthy. You know, they're healthy enough to move, right? And uh, sometimes they have to pass physical exams. Uh, people coming to the United States and to other immigrant destinations, like immigrants uh, going to Canada and to Australia, they have to pass medical exams. So there are barriers. So healthier people are selected to immigration. Well, some people might say, well, you know, there are a lot of illegal immigrants, uh, undocumented immigrants in the United States. And uh, I can tell you that they are selected too because they have barriers to to overcome uh, uh, to uh, to to make it to to the United States or to, to other countries. So they're physically and, and psychologically, uh, we we feel like people who are immigrants who are willing to move from one country to another, they're psychologically uh ready to improve their lives, their lives of their families, there's optimism, and uh, these things are conducive with good health. So migration selection uh, was an explanation that we would propose at the time, and uh, um, I think it's still a viable explanation today as I go out through the more recent evidence. So the next slide will uh, show you that when we reviewed literature up to 2005, uh, there were problems with the data. So everybody said, well, you know, maybe they, and by that time, the population was living longer. The data were not as correct, uh, but whatever data we had pointed to higher life expectancy among uh, Mexican-Americans and among other Hispanic groups. Now, there was a problem with the data, you know, vital statistics data, uh, which is like a uh, number of deaths divided by population estimates, right? Uh, they show a high advantage in mortality in, in Hispanics in the United States. And uh, the advantage was greatest among older people. Now, uh, there was a problem with, with this method, which is misclassification of ethnicity or ethnic background on death certificates. So when people die, and in the end, a funeral director will enter the person's ethnicity on the death certificate. And sometimes if somebody looks Anglo-white, um, but he's a Mexican background, uh, he will be labeled as Anglo White, and, and that will, will 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 decrease the the mortality estimates of the population. So the, this misclassification is about now it's about six percent, and the people working in this area, in the government, National Center for Health Statistics, they have a good handle on it, and they can adjust their estimates of mortality. Uh, but at the time when we were looking at that, yeah. That, that was a problem. Now, one way to avoid this misclassification of ethnicity on death certificates uh, is these large national community surveys. Uh, these are large surveys, like the current population survey in the United States, uh, the um, national um, health uh, uh, community surveys that Mexico also has, which we follow up and there is a, uh, a national death index where we can trace everybody who dies from these surveys down the road and, uh, and find out uh, who died and how many and so on. And uh, the, the advantage of these surveys is that the ethnicity of the decedent or the people who died later is established up front at the time of the interview. 
So it's not the funeral director deciding by, by looking at you and say you're Hispanic or you're black or white or, or whatever. So even though there, there are some disadvantages with this data, this data are preferred. Uh, and, uh, but they, they suggest also it's still an advantage, even though it's smaller. Now, one, Dr. Paloni, who has been here apparently in recent uh, weeks, uh, proposed based on some analysis that the advantage in mortality of the Hispanic population in the United States, especially the Mexican origin population, uh, can be explained by selective return migration of less healthy immigrants to Mexico. So there's always been this theory that when other Mexican Americans, who were especially those born in Mexico, went to the United States, became old and became sick, they go back to Mexico uh, to, and then they die there. And if they do that and they die there, the mortality rates of the people who stay in the United States uh, become deflated, artificially lower. And uh, this people call a uh, salmon bias. Salmon, you know, the salmon when they, the time comes after they, uh, a certain point of time, they, they, they swim up the river to go die in Alaska or wherever they go. And so this salmon bias is a potential explanation that we needed to pay attention to at that time. Now, then there's another source of data on mortality, which is social security data, which were supposed to be really, and I think they are more accurate because they don't have the problems yet. They showed an advantage also, but it was not as great. Now, this challenge of the uh, Samuel bias is something that people have followed up with, and the next slide will show that, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. So what we concluded at the time is that the majority of the evidence continued to support a mortality advantage in the, especially Mexican Americans, and especially among older people. But even though there was an advantage in mortality, uh, there was no advantage in uh, other measures of health status of older people, such as self-reports or disability measures and so on. Now, we suggested at the time that this is a long living population. Mexican Americans live longer, but they live longer by the time they, they become old with more disability, more diabetes, more problems, and so on. Now, I also thought at the time that for good theoretical reasons, uh, even though data were not available at the time, there was a, a trend toward more disability in the Mexican American population with time. And I believe that may be taking place in Mexico and other developing countries now that are experiencing increases in life expectancy. People are living longer, but they're living longer with more disability and, and, and morbidity in their older years. That was happening in the United States <coughs> and other countries in the Western world in the 70s. Beginning with the mid-80s, Western countries began showing an improvement in the health of older people. Disability rates began to come down for a number of reasons because of the improvements in uh, the care of older people. Assistive devices were coming in. So there were some good news uh, that uh, very, older, very old people were, were becoming healthier. Now, more recent data suggests that maybe there's been a stop to that. And especially among people who are like 60 to 70, we call them in the business the young old. You know. uh, there may be some evidence in more recent years in the United States that uh, these young old are becoming, again, a little more disabled. And the reason these young old may become more disabled is because it increases in obesity and diabetes that have taken place in the Western world and also. Uh, that's something that needs to be investigated. Nevertheless, the, the larger trend was for some improvement in the 80s and 90s in the health of older people in the general population. But we felt at the time that maybe 
developing country populations and also Mexican Americans who are kind of like the developing country population. Uh, many similar to the older people in Mexico were becoming more disabled at the time than they were doing longer with uh, uh, more disability. But there was still this challenge of the return migration that might explain things. So the next slide um, will show you some more recent evidence. This is a very influential paper uh, that was published in 2008. They used Social Security and Medicare data, which are very, very uh, complete. Uh, and they cover pretty much 95% uh, of Mexican Americans and other Hispanics. Now, these data supported what I called earlier a salmon bias. Like, yes, indeed, foreign born people who get Social Security, which is most Mexican American older people, living in other countries, let's say Mexico, they had higher mortality rates than foreign born beneficiaries living in the United States. So people who migrated back to Mexico or other Central American and Latin uh, Hispanic countries, uh, they were, they had poorer health. And, and, and therefore there is a sample bias. But this sample bias, this bias was way too small to explain the advantages of the Hispanic population in the United States in mortality. So they were too small. At the same time, uh, this study was the first one to really point out that there is a return sample bias. And, and, and here is you have people who were sick, went to Mexico, and they got sicker there. And then they came back to the United States. Why do they came, come back to the United States? Because their children are there. So it's like people from New York going to Florida to retire. When they become sick, they go back to New York because their family is there. So there is that going on. So all of this, when you put it together, uh, does not support uh, any evidence that the mortality advantage of the Hispanic Latino population in the United States is artificially biased by migration patterns or, or, or anything. So, indeed, the sentiment today is that this is a population that is a long-living population. But I, as I said earlier, long-living with more problems. So, in the next slide, I will show you a different test of this return migration, which has to do with infant mortality. My colleagues at the University of Texas, they use like millions of records of infant mortality in, 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 in Hispanics, or Mexican origin, uh, immigrants, and, and native born. And they basically found that even in the first hour of life, the first day of life, the first three days of there was an advantage in the mortality rates of immigrants, the foreign born. They had healthier babies, less likely to die. Uh, and, uh, and if that's the case, there's no way that any return migration of mothers in the first hour after giving birth, or first day or even first three days, who go back to Mexico and the babies die there, uh, there's no way that would be a, a reason favorable mortality rates. So we have, at the end of, other end of the life cycle, advantages in, in mortality, in infant mortality, especially among immigrants, uh, foreign born Hispanics, especially really Mexican Americans, uh, that do not support any problems uh, because of return migration. So, Now, another way to look at these uh, uh, data on, on the mortality situation of the, of the United States, uh, Hispanic origin and immigrant population, is to look at data from Mexico. So there is a Mexican Health and Aging study, a very large study of 15,000 people 50 and over, conducted in 2000, 2002. And, uh, and, and now it's going to go back in the field with my colleague Rebecca Wong, who is the uh, 
principal investigator, and some of you, of course, know Rebecca. Uh, and, and there will be new data on, on the health of older Mexicans coming up in the next year or so. Now, data from Mexico, uh, from the MHAS, had extensive migration histories where they asked these people, 50 and over, representative sample of Mexico, if they had lived in the United States, and, uh, and, and, and a sizable minority, I believe, 12% or so, 10%, uh, had lived in the United States, and they went back, okay? So, but they went back at an average age of 42, I believe, at a fairly young age. They did not go back in their older years, which is a previous theory that older people go back and then they die there, and then the mortality rates back in the United States are, are lower than they should be. So very few people go back to Mexico in their older years because their children live in the United States. Now, uh, the data that uh, Rebecca Wong uh, has on the MHAS that show that the people who go back to Mexico around age 42 or average, they tend to be people who uh, made it, made some money, and went back to Mexico to start a business. Okay? The people who maybe failed the business, or there may be people who indeed had some health problems and were back. There's some evidence from Mexico that families get together and sometimes select the most likely person to succeed uh, as an immigrant. So we send our best bet uh, to go out working in the United States, and perhaps that person will send them. And you know, there is a lot of money coming back from Mexico, remittances, we call them, from, from immigrants uh, back to their families. So, uh, anyway, this is uh, looking from Mexico, uh, and, and, and hopefully the new Mexican Health and Aging Study data will give us more information. Uh, so all of this supports to the feeling that, man, there is a, something about this Mexican origin population. Uh, there are some strengths, some reasons why they live on that. And uh, after that, I will uh, try to summarize things. Now, what this kind of thing does, uh, the favor of mortality rates in a population that is socioeconomically disadvantaged, uh, leads to a socioeconomic gradient of mortality and health that is lower among uh, immigrant populations among the Mexican origin population than the general population. Uh, in other words, you got a lot of people who are lower socioeconomic status, who come into the country as immigrants, who do not make very much money, not very educated, but they have reasonably good health and low mortality rates. So the, so the socioeconomic variation in mortality is, is, is lower. And, uh, the conclusion was that the mortality, Hispanic mortality advantage, is primarily because of persons who are poor, who are low residents, and poor immigrants. And uh, in the next slide uh, will show one of my colleagues uh, looked at uh, people who die at younger ages in California and uh, in Texas, the largest two Hispanic areas, uh, at least with respect to Mexican immigrants. It, it looked at mortality of younger people, 15 to 44, uh, because that all the other studies were with older people, where most of the mortality takes place in older people. Right? But some people die in younger years. And what he found there is that uh, the mortality advantage in younger people is, is confined to foreign-born Hispanics. Again, the notion that this Im immigration, immigrants, are really driving but the advantages that immigrant Mexican Americans have over Mexican Americans born in the United States are primarily attributed to social and behavioral causes, like the substance abuse, HIV, suicide, and so on. So, in other words, immigrants come in and do, they do not have these problems that the native born Mexican Americans have. So, there is this acculturation hypothesis. That immigrants come in, they're healthy, they have better healthy behaviors, but uh, the next generation, uh, they uh, they assume uh, 
behaviors in, uh, that are uh, more detrimental to, to their health. So um, uh, there's another paper that uh, kind of looked at closely the under ascertainment of uh, mortality on, on death certificates, which I talked about earlier, which could be a problem. I don't think it's much of a problem anymore. But basically, uh, what was found there was that even after adjusting for those, that the foreign-born Hispanics had a significant advantage of uh, 25 to 30 percent compared to non-Hispanic whites in mortality rates. And, but not the native-born. The native-born became more like the, the native-born uh, Anglo-Americans or non-Hispanic white Americans. So, particular evidence of this Hispanic paradox is being driven perhaps by a healthy immigrant effect, the immigrants who come in healthy but also with healthy health behaviors. Next uh, slide, uh, I won't say very much about that because it's pretty much another, uh, um, another attempt to, uh, to adjust death certificates for misclassification of ethnicity on, uh, on, on, on death rates. And what they found here is that uh, foreign-born Hispanics had higher rates of, of correct classification of their ethnicity uh, or the U.S. Hispanics on, on their certificates. Like when a funeral director looked at somebody and family members there and the person was a foreign-born immigrant, uh, the, it, it was more likely that that person would be called a Mexican origin Hispanic person than the Mexican-American born in the United States who may look more like uh, a, a not even Hispanic one. All of this is giving credence to, to the immigrant advantage of mortality compared to the native-born uh, Mexican-Americans and also uh, non-Hispanic whites. Next, and, and what's going on? Uh, this is not just an immigrant advantage that we see in Mexican uh, immigrants or other immigrants from Latin America. And there's some evidence from all kinds of immigrant groups in the United States that immigrants are indeed healthier, they come in healthier, and the farthest away they come, especially when they come from Asia, uh, the healthier they are, just because they are selected. And, uh, and uh, so, but there's also evidence that immigrants who come in after a given point in time, after 20 or 30 years, they kind of begin to lose that advantage uh, and uh, become more like the native-born population. And, and certainly their children become more like the native-born population. And, and that advantage uh, that disappears or declines over time after immigrants come through is also observed in Australia and Canada, uh, where the immigrants are primarily from Asian origin, and they come in healthy, and then they lose some of that advantage over time. And these three countries have quite decent data showing that indeed the uh, immigrants are healthier, but at, at the same time, with time, they become less healthy. Uh, as uh, they live uh, in, in the host country. And they bring better health behaviors, but then they become more obese, for example. And uh, then, then they become more diabetic and so on. Now, I'll go to the next slide. And the, another approach to this Hispanic paradox is where do these immigrants who are healthy live? Well, they live in, in immigrant communities especially in the southwestern United States, they come from Mexico and they move to the barrios of Los Angeles, San Antonio, Houston, Dallas, and other places. Uh, and their familiar environments, so immigrant environments provide a supportive environment, especially people who move in their older years and they're more And so is there something about living in barrios or immigrants which is conducive to better health uh, to um, to Mexican Americans, whether they're immigrants or not, and, and especially the older people. In, in neighborhoods and health, 
It's an increasingly important area of research. But we don't just look at individuals and ask them about their diseases and their socioeconomic situation. But uh, we look at where they live, because where they live may have an independent influence on their health uh, over and above their individual characteristics. So my socioeconomic or my educational background influences my health, but also the community I live in also has an influence on my health because communities provide resources, they provide um, better food, uh, better access to certain uh, facilities and uh, recreational facilities. Well, people looked at these immigrant communities for Chinese and also Mexican origin in some of these big cities. They found indeed that uh, immigrant concentration, heavy immigrant communities, uh, they uh, were associated with lower consumption of, of, of high-fat foods among Hispanics and Chinese. In other words, the availability of healthier food was an advantage, and, but there were some problems within immigrant communities because they did not have all the recreational facilities, and uh, walkability was more difficult uh, because the sidewalks were not as good and so on. Maybe there was more crime in the area. But let, let me just say here that in our work with older Mexican-Americans, we have found that there are some advantages for older Mexican-Americans who live in heavily Mexican-American barrio neighborhoods. Uh, and that shows up in depression rates and, 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 and mortality rates and, and other outcomes. And the reason is possibly because these Mexican uh, origin communities are really important for older people because older people, uh, older Mexican Americans, they're more limited to their immediate environment. They live and they don't work really anymore. But they live in these environments where the, uh, the language is Spanish, uh, the, the stores are, and restaurants are real Mexican, the church is not Irish Catholic, but it is Mexican Catholic. And all of these community resources probably contribute to a more supportive environment. Now, a lot of this literature is, is still evolving, and we're trying to get better measures of the, the nature of communities, not just in this population, but in other populations, to tell us more about the mechanisms whereby communities influence the health of older people. Uh, another important study was done by Eileen Crimmins and colleagues in Southern California, uh, looking at the national uh, Haynes uh, uh, Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, I know Mexico has one of those, uh, very large, and looked at the more biological variables, which are the mechanisms whereby other background variables influence people's health. Then, indeed, they found that uh, the U.S. born Mexican Americans, they actually looked worse than the non Hispanic whites. But the foreign born Mexican Americans biologically were very similar to the non Hispanic whites. Well, that was still kind of supporting the Hispanic paradox. But even though they were biologically similar to the non Hispanic white, everything we know about mortality, they somehow did not. And why is that the case? That's part of the, the paradox that people are still working on. And uh, next slide um, was, there's the Mexican Family Life Survey that I'm sure you guys are familiar with. And there may be more data that are more relevant coming here. This is a large survey of people in Mexico who are followed up to the United States, and some people do immigrate, and, and basically what they found is that people uh, who immigrated, they were not necessarily any healthier, uh, and therefore this was kind of speaking against the notion of the healthy immigrant effect or the migration selection. Um, but what's wrong with this study, not much wrong with this study, it's a very nice study, but at this point they have very few numbers of immigrants from Mexico to the United States, where they traced them back. And, and they were young people too, you know, 15 to 29. And that's when health problems really show up, the mortality really show up. So in the future, I expect the data from Mexico will follow 
immigrants to the United States who give us new information about uh, the, the healthy immigrant effect. And my guess is that, I, my bias is that they indeed will. The next one. Okay, this is the first official life table for all demographers. You know the life tables are. Uh, that was uh, conducted by the National Health Statistics in the United States. Elizabeth Arias, a very well known demographer. And they were the first official where they, they really work hard to adjust for all the problems in the data, especially the misclassification of ethnicity on death rates, right? And, and these were published in October of 2010. And they made a big splash in the media. You know, they were all over TV, radio, and so on, uh, as if it was something new. I mean, we knew before. And we were in the media talking about how research before. But again, anytime this comes out, people say, wow, wow, what's going on here? Why do Hispanics live longer than the rest of us? And the data which the belief was that they're fairly accurate. Uh, they were not broken up by immigrants and, and natives, but nevertheless, all Hispanics, uh, average life expectancy, 80.6 years for both uh, genders, and about two and a half years you know, higher than the non-Hispanic white, and about 7.7 year, years higher than the non-Hispanic black. So, again, wow, I mean, this is a big difference, and it shows up in both males and females. Now, what Elizabeth Aries is going to do next, she's going to do life tables for immigrants versus native-born Hispanics. And the idea there is to see, is this really the immigrants that are driving this advantage? I think it is, primarily, but there may be some advantages of the native-born that still show up in life expectancy figures. The other thing she needs to do, and she plans to do, is at least for the major groups, for the Mexican origin population, which is two-thirds of the Hispanic population, is to do life tables just for the Mexican origin population. And again, that's going to be very, very uh, uh, educational for us. And, uh, and she did another thing that uh, was really a very conservative thing. She looked at the 80-plus the, the rates for Hispanics. She adjusted them to be similar to the 80 plus rates for non-Hispanic whites, just because there's question marks about the very old and how accurate are these data. And the advantages there were showing up to be so great. But even when we made the assumption that those rates were similar to the non-Hispanic whites, there was still this terrific advantage uh, of the population. So here's where we are now with respect to life expectancy. We have a very, Long living population that not supposed to be so, so long living based on another of its characteristic. So, do I have like 10 more minutes? Do I have like 10 more minutes? Seven. Seven minutes. Okay, let me go quickly. This is not the conclusion of the overall talk, but it's the conclusion of the Hispanic paradigm. So, uh, we think now that, again, migration selection is really what's driving the health of uh, well, at least a number of countries in the population. And it shows up not just in the U.S., but in Canada and Australia. Traditional uh, immigrant destinations uh, where immigrants have gone and stayed. Uh, there is a salmon bias, people moving back in their old age, but it's too small to explain the advantages. We need to do more with immigrant communities, okay? I look for mechanisms how communities contribute to uh, to, to good health. Uh, and, and low class has different meanings to Mexican Americans and non Hispanic tribes and African Americans. I won't say very much about this, but uh, you know, there, there are a lot of poor immigrants who work two or three jobs that live in the United States, but they're socially engaged. Okay, they work hard, uh, they take care of their families, they send back money to their families in Mexico. And, uh, but they, they are poor, but they're not suffering from poverty as much as they are black Americans or white Americans, many of whom are poor because they sink into poverty because they got in trouble with the law or with uh, drugs or, uh, and so on. 
Now, the other thing is that uh, we uh, uh, we see increasing rates of obesity and diabetes, not just in the United States, the Mexican Americans, but also in Mexico. And that's something to keep an eye on. Are the immigrants of the future going to be more obese and have more problems? And uh, if I go next to uh, give you some recent data that I think are really the next slide. Uh, from, we have this big study I mentioned earlier. It's now a study with the uh, almost 4,000 older people from the southwestern United States. And uh, uh, these are my colleagues, some of you, you may know. The next slide will show that I have colleagues in San Antonio. And, and then uh, what we did, the next slide will show you that we took an area probability sample. So we had a representative sample of older Mexican Americans in the United States, the southwestern United States, uh, those five states, Texas, New Mexico, Colorado, Arizona, and California. And, and then um, uh, uh, we uh, followed them up um, every two or three years. And the next slide will show you kind of the, the history of the study. We began with 3,050. And every two or three years, we go and interview them again, and we give them physical exams in addition. Uh, right here in 2004-05, uh, there were 1,167 who were 75 and over, and we added another 900 who were 75 and over. So we have like a combined new cohort of 2,069 people 75 and over. Then they followed them up again and again. And now in the field, we completed interviews with 11 almost 1,100 people who are 80 and over. We also uh, added a sample of one of their children or a close family member who we are using as an informant to tell us about the health and financial family situation of the older person. And many of these people will, will be caregivers, and that's something we intend to do. Uh, but when we added a new sample, we're now able to look at trends in the health of people over time. And the next slide will show you that indeed, uh, when it comes to uh, activities of daily living disability, and these are the basic tasks we have to do uh, to take care of ourselves, like taking a bath, going to the bathroom, eating, and so on. And uh, if we cannot do them, then somebody else is doing it for them. So more recent evidence, in both men and women, shows an increase in disability among older people who are 75 and over, uh, in partially due because of increases in diabetes, um, mild increases in, uh, in, in hypertension, uh, mild increases in obesity, but also increases in cognitive impairment. And, and that goes along with increases in diabetes. Uh, so you have a population that is living longer, but it's living longer with more health problems and more disability. And I think that's going to be the case in Mexico when the, the data come out. And that's because of the epidemiologic stage that Mexico is in, and other Latin America countries, where you're seeing increases in life expectancy, but also you're seeing increases in people living longer with problems. And, and of course, it's such a challenge to Mexico, and especially other countries in Latin America, because the infrastructure is and the institutions to to deal with this aging problem, not just an increased number of people, but an increased number of uh, people with, with poor health. Uh, but again, these need to be more examined in more detail, and certainly the Mexican health and aging study and other Mexicans will help us with Mexico. So I uh, will go to the next slide and show you that uh, this study is ongoing. Uh, we're interested in all of this, I don't really have errors, but most of these things move this way, of course, uh, and, and these are the, in aging, the things that we're interested in, cognitive function, physical function, emotional function, people getting into nursing homes and so on, and all the medical and psychosocial variables that influence these changes. And we hope to keep this going on, and uh, we hope to collaborate with the Mexican Health and Aging Study because it is actually based in my institution, and we hope to collaborate with people here. Um, Cesar is working with us, and, uh, and hopefully others. So we look forward to uh, to to the future of uh, study of aging, 
and, and the health of, of a population, not just in the United States, but also in Mexico and other countries in Latin America. So I'll stop here. We have a great question. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Marquides. Vamos a ahora a escuchar el comentario de César González. Eh, César es el maestro en demografía por el Colegio de la Frontera Norte y doctor en estudios de población del Colegio de México y actualmente investigador en el Instituto Nacional de Geriatría. Gracias. Gracias. Good morning or good afternoon to everyone on everywhere. First of all, I would like to thank Estela Rivero for the invitation to comment Dr. Marquides' presentation. I am very happy to be part of this session. The Hispanic paradox has received much attention over the past 25 years, both in the epidemiological and demographic literature. And this is an interesting and well-documented topic, and Dr. Marquides has given us an insightful and comprehensive explanation of the paradox, beginning with the concept following with the possible explanations for the migrant health advantage in the U.S., the data artifact, the acculturation or assimilation effect, and the selectivity in migration with two hypotheses, the healthy migrant and the salmon bias. Also, subtly, show us the different data sources and populations commonly used to explore the paradox. And here, it's necessary to emphasize the use of data from host and origin country. And finally, the health outcome, mortality, morbidity, and functional capacity, among others. For sharing a comparable socioeconomic profile, lack of health insurance coverage, and lower rates of healthcare service use, the logical outcome for, for life expectancy among Hispanics should be lower than the presented for non-Hispanic black population. But the Hispanic life expectancy is, is equal or even higher than the one of the non-Hispanic white population. Some Hispanic health patterns appear to contradict the expectations based on the well-documented social gradient in health, and this phenomenon is better known as the Hispanic paradox. These unexpected results are observed in mortality and also with certain measures of health status and health-related behaviors. I want to remark that Dr. Marquides and Dr. Correo were the first to refer to the health status of Hispanics in the United States as an, as an epidemiolog epidemiological paradox in 1996, 25 years ago. Numerically, the study of the Hispanic paradox seems indispensable. Latinos are the largest U.S. racial or ethnic minority group, representing 16% of the U.S. population in 2010. And Mexicans comprise almost 63% of the U.S. Latino population and 10% of the total U.S. population. Thus, a better understanding of this issue can lead to improve the health and social conditions of immigrants and natives. Research provides substantial evidence that Hispanic health care needs are largely unmet. The Latino population encounters several barriers to health care access, among them the, la the lack of health insurance, transportation, and the an underutilization of preventive health services. Then, the emphasis in public health and public policy should be on health disparities, paying attention on between-group differences in the prevalence of morbidity and, mor and mor mortality, as well as access to and utilization of health services. I think that in a forum like this, the results of research and its implications on public and health policy should be included in the presentation. Maybe next time you could give us some um, data of this. Mm -hmm. Returning to the Hispanic paradox, particularly the health selection and the Mexican immigrants, I have one question. Early in the migration process, workers were mostly men in agriculture or farming occupations, while women joined to the flow increasingly in later years. According with previous literature, the nature of the migration patterns is vastly different across gender. The cohorts of Racero program, now the older adults, include mostly economic migrants among men and family migrants among women. Then, it is possible that the initial positive sele health selection for migrants apply to a larger extent to men than to women. So my question is, how different are the findings by sex? I understand that the time for presentation was limited and you were not able to present in detail. But being gender differences so important, maybe two or three ideas about this, for example, in chronic disease or disability, will clarify and complete the scenario. 
Also, previous literature has examined the selectivity of U.S. migrants from Mexico by socioeconomic conditions, family networks, and health. This body of research has concluded that the initial migrants to the United States from Mexico tend to be self-selected among those with groups with low education, young, men more than women, with networks of previous migrants to the United States, and with better pre-migration health. A second question is whether the Hispanic paradox is likely to persist in the future. It is not clear if in migrants in the new cohorts will arrive with the same or similar sets of, so of social and behavioral characteristics shown with in previous cohorts. The Mexican population has undergone rapid changes, as evidenced in increases in educational attainment, but also increases in obesity, diabetes, and uh, hypertension prevalence, and there is evidence pointing to a lessening of positive selection in more recent cohorts of U.S. immigrants to Mexico. How the combination of these factors will affect the persistence of the Hispanic paradox in mortality, morbidity, and the associated burden of disability. Do you think that the new immigrants still have this health advantage? Complementary, if we think the paradox, the Hispanic paradox, as a result from the combination of health status, acculturation, and selectivity, which factors are neutralizing and which ones are perpetuating the, the Hispanic paradox? Maybe the new immigrants are less healthy, but they are more educated. Um, perhaps the enclaves are helping and the acculturation process is less stressful. And, and talking about this combination, maybe um, it's interesting. And thinking about the migration moment and assuming that the health selectivity is the most viable explanation for the Hispanic paradox, two ideas seems very interesting to me. The persistence of the health selection effect and the factors underlying the better health of the migrant. As you say, maybe with the MHAS or with the um, MB, as we say in Mexico, we can, um, ha we can, maybe we have more elements to answer these two questions. Anyway, we could spend the entire morning formulating questions about the Hispanic paradox. This is an interesting, extensive, and edgy topic with variations by age, gender, Hispanic group, degree of acculturation, and a specific disease or, ca or cause of death. Like in almost all researchers, research issues, we found three groups with different, with different approaches. The majority who are trying to prove the existence of the Hispanic paradox and find evidence to prove it, those who are trying to refute it and do it, and those who use it, the Hispanic paradox, to explain other topics. As Dr. Mar Marquides pointed out in his conclusions, overall the Hispanic paradox persists and more research is needed to decipher it. Along with the theory, the evidence, and the next steps, Dr. Marquides presents a longitudinal data source for exploring the Hispanic paradox, the Hispanic EPC. A six-wave study with the baseline collected in 1990, 1993 and 1994, the baseline, the baseline data covered demographic characteristics, social and physical functioning, chronic conditions, related health problems, lifestyle behaviors, self-report, use of dental hospital, and nursing home services, depression and mortality, among others. Longitudinal studies like this can distinguish changes over time within individuals from differences among people in their baseline levels and can provide information on possible causes and effects of those changes. If someone is, if someone is interested in migration, health and aging in Mexican-American population, here you have a very good source of information to explore the three issues. Finally, briefly, I will tell you my family's migration history. I have about 15 relatives in the United States, including my parents, who migrated 70 years ago. While there, my parents get divorced. Later, my father married to an American woman, and now he is a U.S. citizen. She, he shares the lifestyle pattern followed by the foreign-born Mexican immigrants. He smokes, occasionally drink, almost never went to the doctor, but so far, he remains healthy, and, think, and I think this his life expectancy will reach the average for Latino population. In part, his case confir confirms the Hispanic paradox. My mother also shares some features founded in the literature. With economic and health problems, at the beginning of this year, she becomes a return migrant. Her history also contributes to the Hispanic paradox through the Salmon bias hypothesis. Thank you.
Yes, 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 sir. Would you like to react? Well, I just say one thing that, you know, what, and maybe we'll have questions, but you raise a good question about is, is the Hispanic paradox currently a, a cohort phenomenon that might disappear in the future? I mean, are the future immigrants going to be different just because Mexico is changing too? It's not just uh, the United States. And we, I mentioned that there's high increases in obesity. Mex the Mexican obesity rates are very high, kind of similar to the United States, if not higher. So um, we used to say, well, you know, the immigrants from Mexico, they came, they, they were less obese, uh, lower diabetes, and, and they, our data have shown that, uh, no, no rates of diabetes. So will, that, will that change uh, in the future where the, the, the future immigrants will be less healthy? Um, time, time will tell. And, and, you know, this is more of a socio-political issue, too, you know, you know, the context of migration. Um, you have to look at it in the larger picture of, of, uh, of the socioeconomic conditions of the world right now, not just, not just this part of the world, but the worldwide economic crisis. What is that doing to, uh, to migration patterns and, um, and the kind of people who move? Thank you. Entonces vamos a empezar con la ronda de intervenciones, preguntas o comentarios de las distintas sedes que nos están eh, escuchando y, y, y viendo por videoconferencia. Eh, le voy a pedir a cada institución que voy a ir nombrando que enciendan el micrófono para saber si tienen comentarios y preguntas y de una vez nos digan cuántas y cuáles y hacerlas tal vez de corrido para pedirle después al doctor si es necesaria una respuesta, una reacción. Eh, empezaré entonces por el Colegio de Michoacán. Pregunto si tienen allá alguna pregunta o comentario. Sí, Manuel Ángel. Muy buenas tardes. Somos seis personas aquí en el Colegio de Michoacán. Hemos aprendido mucho de esta exposición por el doctor Marquides, porque en parte está utilizando datos generados tanto en Estados Unidos como en México. Yo, mi nombre es Keo Mamert y estoy eh, interesado en plantear dos puntos. Eh, yo creo que podemos, los investigadores que estamos viendo en comunidades rurales, cómo están atendiendo su salud, ex migrantes y, par y parientes de migrantes que... Eh, que podemos aportar algo a entender el porqué de estos iris y venires, porque están indicando que algunas ideas acerca de el regreso cuando uno se enferma o el, el regreso a México y luego el regreso hacia Estados Unidos porque jalan los hijos y nietos que están allá. Mi, mi, yo quisiera enmarcar esto en, en un marco de ciclo de cuidados, porque si están regresando de México hacia Estados Unidos para tener atención médica o porque de pie, dependen de esos hijos que están establecidos en Estados Unidos. O sea, tendríamos que juntar también información acerca de los propósitos que los llevan a hacer estos viajes. Por ejemplo, se mencionó que a veces gente que está como adulto mayor, a pesar de ya necesitar cuidados, también están cuidando de otros miembros de la familia. Pueden ser abuelos que están cuidando a nietos, por ejemplo. Pueden ser abuelos que se trasladan hacia Estados Unidos para cuidar a nietos allí. Entonces yo creo que es muy interesante hacernos nuevas preguntas acerca del acceso a y uso de múltiples sistemas de salud dentro de cada país. Tenemos personas que están atendiéndose simultáneamente o sucesivamente dentro de varios eh, sistemas de salud. Gracias. Es la única intervención del Colegio de Michoacán. The purpose in the last three, the purpose of the trips to the United States health or care of the grandchildren. 
Maybe these three lines. Oh yeah. Purpose of the trip to US. Because some Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, I think these are very, very good, very good questions. The the older people who are Mexican origin in the United States, we think that about ninety three, ninety four percent have Medicare, which is health insurance for older people. Uh, they earn Medicare by living in the United States and working. And, and getting social security. So they are really reasonably well insured compared to middle-aged Mexican Americans who are not very well insured. So they do have access, reasonably good access to, to health care. Uh, if I understood correctly, uh, there, there are some people who may go back to Mexico to, to get medical care, especially people living along the border who cross over to get medical care uh, that is much uh, cheaper, uh, like to go to the dentist or to buy medicines. And, and there is quite a bit of that that is not really very well documented, but uh, quite a bit of that is taking place. And not just Mexican origin folks go to Mexico, uh, others do because of, of the cost of, of, of health care. Uh, so the, the, there may be multiple health systems uh, using care in the United States, but also using care along the border. Uh, there's something about the care of grandchildren. Uh, what, what, what is that? I mean, maybe, purpose, maybe they are not going back to the United States because they are sick. But well, I, I mentioned earlier that people, they, older, they don't go back to Mexico when, when they're older because they have children and grandchildren in the United States. And we do know that grandparents in, in this population are very important to the extended family. So when they don't work anymore, uh, they become a resource for the middle-aged families who have children and who are out working. And in the southwestern United States, in, in many of the areas, uh, Mexican-American elderly people live close by with their children. Uh, they do have a lot of children, kind of like in Mexico, maybe more really there. Uh, some of them have migrated away from the southwest to the southeast and other areas because of their opportunities. But, but there's still a family support system for these older people. And we're, we're, we're getting really a handle with that little bit of collecting on this. But uh, th there's no doubt that the older Mexican Americans are also a support system to the ch to the children of their children, to their grandchildren. And uh, so they do have a role. And, and again, you may say, you know, having a role in the extended family uh, means you are more engaged in life, that you're not isolated and, and lonely and alone. And uh, uh, I'm not saying there are no problems, but, but there is a lot of integration in the community and the family by the older Mexican-American population. Bien, eh, la siguiente institución pedimos si en el CIESAS tienen preguntas o comentarios. No, no tenemos ninguna pregunta, gracias. Gracias. Pregunta ahora en el Colegio de la Frontera Norte, por favor. Sí, sí, este, buenas tardes, muchas gracias por la presentación. Acá somos 11 personas que estuvimos al tanto de la presentación del doctor Marquides y tenemos dos comentarios, uno por parte del profesor Roberto Ham y otro por parte de Silvia Mejía, así que les doy la palabra. you tell us about the Mexican Americans. Uh, I was wondering if uh, within the social determinants of health, 
context. Uh, the living environment and social networks should be uh, better measured and better understand. And maybe, uh, can you tell us more about it and what do you think it could uh, help to understand that advantage in mortality? Uh, I was wondering also if, if that data we were analyzing before together to, uh, with you about the distance between the border and where uh, people live in, in the U.S. It was actually a very good indicator of what was happening or, or what is happening in the environment and maybe it should be there some clue to understand things. Talking about the, the environment and possible changes. No, it's okay. It's okay, Cocos, if you want to answer. Okay, okay, I will. I, I, have, I don't have. Uh, I, I don't. I don't have really a question. I, I had one, but uh, I think that Gail asked uh, those uh, things that I was wondering better than me. So it's, it's, it's okay about that. It's just uh, it's a great pleasure to meet you, and of course with your enlightening, always enlightening ideas, and uh, even if this is uh, at a long distance. Uh, thank you very much. That's it. Thank you. Yeah. Comment uh, on the previous uh, comments. Yes. Sorry. Well, if, if I understood correctly, there were questions about the social networks and, and, and the environment yeah. and, and how they, they may be changing and influencing the health of the, the population. And let me tell you that I am a strong believer that immigrants to all countries are healthy people. They, they go in, and, uh, but, but then when you follow their life's trajectories, uh, especially, the, let's say, the immigrants from Mexico, they come to the United States, they may be healthy, but they face a lot of challenges over their life course, okay? They work in very physically demanding posi uh, positions, jobs, uh, where they, they, they face poverty, possible discrimination, uh, and uh, at the same time, they, they face a lifetime of uh, possibly physical labor and, and limited socioeconomic resources. And at the same time, they have substandard medical care. And, and really, uh, a lot of the problems of, of all the people that have the disability I mentioned earlier begin in middle age and uh, where chronic diseases come into the picture and uh, where there is not enough uh, uh, access to medical care. So they, they, they may end up in old age by you know, uh, living with the idea that they're going to be living longer than others, but they do have more problems because of the trajectory of, of, of difficulties and challenges that they face over their life course. And now, how is the environment changing? Well, for some things, the environment may be getting better, especially for older immigrants who are coming into, into the Southwest. Uh, there, there is a tendency, we believe from our data, for people to bring their parents uh, to the United States uh, when they get older and sick because th they live here and, uh, and and those older people th that immigrate to the United States in their older years uh, are advantaged compared to immigrants who come from other countries. They are advantaged because they move into Hispanic areas, okay, that are familiar uh, environments and uh, more and more so because the Southwest is becoming like Latin America in many ways. Uh, we have examples of other immigrant groups that come from more uh, advantaged backgrounds, let's say from India or Asian countries, and they move to the Silicon Valley in California where their uh, children are very successful, uh, and they end up living in suburbia, you know, in uh, 
suburban communities where they do not have the ethnic resources. A lot of this information is anecdotal, but they, they do not have the advantages of, let's say, the, the Mexican immigrants or all the immigrants coming into southwestern United States, where they, they do have more supports, and uh, whether it's the family or the community. And, uh, and, and in old age, really in health insurance. Uh, I'm not sure I, I, I answered all your questions. Gracias, doctor. Eh, pasamos ahora al Instituto Mora. ¿Tienen alguna pregunta o comentario? Si no, entonces al Colegio de la Frontera Sur. Uh, buenas tardes desde acá. Eh, no, no tenemos ninguna pregunta. Muchas gracias. En el Colegio de San Luis. Evidentemente tampoco. Entonces, terminada la ronda de las salas a distancia, pasaríamos a preguntar si aquí en la sala del colegio hay alguna pregunta o comentario. Eh, eh, ¿Eh? Ah, ¿qué tal? Este, eh, solo un comentario, puede ser en español. Era en torno a, a la cuestión que comentaban en el colegio de Michoacán. Estuvimos participando en un proyecto binacional de salud y tercera edad de, de PIMSA con Verónica Montes de Oca y Rogelio Sáenz. Y ese trabajo era es mucho más cualitativo, se hizo trabajo de campo en los lugares de origen, Zacatecas, Chicago, y posteriormente ya en los lugares de recepción. Y en términos de la diferenciación de género, quería hacer este comentario del papel de los de, de la teoría esta de Salmo, Salmón Vías, eh, no sé cómo se diga, bueno, las vías del salmón o cómo sería en español. ¿Eh? ¿Eh? Ajá, es, este, esta cuestión. Veíamos nosotros mucho la diferencia entre hombres y mujeres. Este, a la población de retorno que entrevistamos, la mayoría que encontramos eran hombres, sobre todo en el caso de Zacatecas. Eran personas ya este, que habían sido, que habían terminado ya su labor en Estados Unidos, eran jubilados. Y en, en el discurso, más que nada en, en las entrevistas salía mucho como que habían terminado este ciclo de, de vida y regresaban a, a morir a México, ¿no? No lo decían como tal, pero ya había como una cuestión de exclusión. Si bien las mujeres sí tenían un papel más activo, las mujeres de la tercera edad como abuelas, como las cuidadoras, ellas estaban como más incluidas ayudando a las hijas, ¿no? A la siguiente generación de reemplazo en, en, en términos laborales, la mujer tenía más activo. Entonces, yo no sé en, en, en términos de las encuestas... Este, ¿Cómo se hace esta diferenciación de género? Porque sí, la población de retorno sí veíamos más a, a los hombres que regresaban a su casa, a su tierra, al patrimonio que lograron construir, como más aprensión a estas cuestiones y las mujeres sí un poco más en, se quedaban. Pero esto digo, es en términos cualitativos, este, son entrevistas a profundidad, fue lo que vimos. Solo eso. Okay. Um, well, if I understood correctly, uh, you, we were talking about gender differences in. Uh, one gender difference I think we have observed over the years in immigrants, um, and then I'll come back to the same bias, but in the immigrant advantage, uh, traditionally the older generation in the United States, the immigrants, the males, the men who immigrated, immigrated primarily for occupational reasons. And if they immigrated primarily for occupational reasons, they were selected because they were able to, to, to work. Uh, 
and, and many women actually follow their families, uh, and so therefore they were not as, as selected physically. Now, data we have looked at from the United States Census and other data that support that. Uh, indeed, that the, <clears throat> the migration selection is more selective of men and, and, than women, at least in this older generation when they came over. Now, with newer immigrants, the picture is not really clear uh, because a lot of women are also immigrating for uh, occupational reasons, and, and therefore they are uh, more likely to, uh, to, to be selected also along with men. Now, with respect to the Samo buyers, uh, people going back, if I understood correctly, you, you mentioned that maybe men may go back, but women may stay because of their taking care of uh, grandchildren and, and families uh, and so on. Uh, I'm not really aware of any, any hard evidence, but that's a, a nice uh, hypothesis that, um, although you, you like to think that, that if, if there is an intact couple who are older, <clears throat> they will go back to Mexico in their old age uh, together, uh, if they're still together, uh, and not one the man goes and, and the woman does it. But the, the other thing that happens is indeed that the life expectancy of men is much lower than women, and therefore a lot more older women in old age in the United States and, and elsewhere. And, and if they're widowed, uh, they may be less likely to go back to Mexico just because of uh, child care responsibilities. Uh, well, I, oops, I just spilled the water. <laughs> uh, well, I want to thank you for your very comprehensive presentation, which uh, was very interesting. And I have two questions. Uh, one has to do with the selection, uh, uh, the selection bias, uh, which, if I understood, uh, you're saying might be one of the most, well, if not the most uh, uh, viable uh, hypothesis to understand. Right. Most, uh, if, well, most of the uh, Hispanic paradox. And my question has to do with, uh, if I, I'm thinking of how to understand the, select, the selectivity bias, and I'm thinking, because I'm working with a student on uh, fertility, uh, well, migrants' fertility, and we're I'm working very hard on how to understand the migrant selectivity and what we are what we've come to uh, understanding about selectivity is that part of the migrant that comes be right before uh, uh, migration uh, because everything that comes after migration is not selectivity that's actually that part that can be adaptation, acculturation, and everything that comes after migration is actually um, what, well, everything that changes after migration. So my question is, uh, is there any way to prove in this term, in health, uh, in migrants' health, uh, a way to prove the selectivity hypothesis. Is there any survey or any data that can help us prove the selectivity bias? Uh, the PC, if I, if data is just well observes migrants in the U.S. The M has uh, works with migrants. Well, it's actually work, works with data in Mexico, and the, well, Graciela Teruero's data is, doesn't really have data, well, doesn't have much migrants' data, if anything. So what I think we want, might want to do is observe, I'm thinking, having data on how much migrants that have not migrated were drinking and how obese they were before migrating and how obese they were after migrating and that's the only way we could be able to prove the well, selectivity. So my question would be 
And I have another question. Right, right. Well, I, I, I really, I, ideally, what you want to do is uh, compare the, 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 the migrants uh, who go to the United States with people who stay behind. Um, and we're just assuming, well, this is a cream of the crop, right? The people who immigrate, they leave the poor areas of Mexico and they go to the United States. Well, we're making the assumption that the people who left behind uh, are, are, are less healthy or less uh, prone to, to live a healthy life uh, because of more poverty, poorer access to health care, and so on. Uh, and we don't really have the data in a big way. Uh, you guys may be more familiar with that. Uh, the Mexican Family Life Survey is giving us that, will give us that, when they have more um, uh, people who immigrate in, uh, to the United States and they compare them to people who stay behind. I mean, that, that's really the, the ultimate way to, to determine to determine that. And I don't know if that was part of your question, I think. And, uh, um, my my other question is, uh, I might be uh, doing something terrible, but <laughs> and, and, um, and coming with a new and completely silly hypothesis. But um, I'm thinking that okay, the acculturation hypothesis tells us that people that migrants adopt bad behaviors as they spend more time in the U.S. And so you have new migrants, and then they comp you compare them with migrants who have been within the U.S. for more time. And usually they compare them with Mexican-Americans who are second generations and, and more. But if you really think about new migrants, you would expect them, new migrants, a new migrant is poor the moment he migrates. But over the life, his life course, you would expect him to improve his status, right? Because as he spends more time in the U.S., you would expect him to get a better job. And as he starts earning more money and learning his way up in, in the U.S. Uh, so I would expect him to get better and, and get healthier. So couldn't you actually see this? Well, I mean, so you, what I'm thinking is you could see two hypotheses. One on the individual level, new migrants to get better over his life their life course and probably over the second generation and more to get worse. Wouldn't this be possible? Well, you know, that's been kicked around the literature because th that is really the, the first thing you think, okay, you, you immigrate to a country that has more resources, better health care, uh, better jobs, uh, and many migrants do improve. Uh, and they make more money and they have more resources. You improve them to get better. But get better than, than what? Uh, because they are healthy enough, they're not going to get any healthier as they get older. Uh, maybe they, 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 are, they get better or less, they decline less than the people who are left back in Mexico who do not have those resources. And, and so if you compare the immigrants, to the people who left were left behind, as they get older, you will find that the immigrants in the United States are better off than the people who left behind. Okay, we haven't really studied that, but that's a good hypothesis. So, even though they do get better socioeconomically and otherwise, that is always accompanied by some negative things that happen. Uh, with time in the United States, and it's not like blaming the United States. Uh, there are things like you end up eating more food that is not as good for you, uh, more meat, for example, because every day you eat meat in the United States where you probably did not do so in Mexico. And uh, we know that even in rural areas in Mexico that um, higher meat consumption and, and, and some of these things 
um, are, are associated with uh, uh, with more, not just with, it, but with, with more uh, heart disease. And that was the case in, 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 let's say, in the 1920s in the Western countries. The people who developed heart disease were rich people because they had more money and they ate more meat and they probably smoked more <laughs> because they could buy cigarettes. And uh, so you, you have some of these factors to contribute to, to, to look at, which are maybe operational in Mexico right now, in some developing countries where um, wealth are doing better in, in a developing country at some point means uh, doing worse because of the, the emergence of, of heart disease and diabetes and things that are related to um, diet and, and exercise and so on. So I, I, I agree that you would expect immigrants to improve because there are a lot of improvements in their lives, uh, but they improve compared to the people who stayed behind. And uh, then uh, they may not improve when it comes to certain other things uh, when they get older. Yeah. Si no hay más preguntas, comentarios, intervenciones, I want to thank you also, Dr. Marquides, for your wonderful presentation. I think we learned a lot. I only have two things that I would like to remark, and they, I think there must be concerns for all of us who will be able to study migration, and Juan deals with the changing profiles of migrants, because we have... Uh, we have moved from a profile that in some time were mainly people who came from rural areas who were to, going to work in agriculture and were less less educated and less income, etc. Now we have a more urbanized country and therefore the profile of migrants has been, become more more educated with higher levels of socioeconomic situations in relative terms, of course. That would make expect some differences and changes that should lead us to concern. But the other issue I think it's important is that on go actually, uh, currently we are living a change in in this uh, uh, in the migration rates that deals with this increasing rates of return migrants. But they are not the return migrants we we have been talking about but because many are forced return migrants. And in, in the past, these forced mi return migrants were migrants, recent migrants. So they had recently crossed and they were detained and, and deported or voluntarily re deported as they used to say. But now with the new policy, the new enforcement policy, you have return migrants with different times of staying in the U.S. So you will have different profiles of return migrants and not only these two the opposite, uh, right. the, those who have Medicare and they return because they are in the final stages of their life cycle. You can have now people with different uh, profiles and I think this is a very important matter of concern for health policies because they don't have Medicare of course but they might have a process of living in the U.S. with all the consequences that you have found, but in a relative short term, shorter term that does with with insurance, and so the the health institutions will have a, a problem to deal with in in the forthcoming future. Well, very thank you very much very again. Nice and, eh, eh, quiero dar las gracias y vamos a regresar al COLEF porque creo que Elmira y Vanis tiene que hacer un anuncio final Bueno, pues nuevamente muchas gracias por la presentación y si sí, efectivamente hay un anuncio final los comerciales siempre van al último y se les invita cordialmente a la novena sesión del seminario que será el martes 22 de noviembre en el, de este año y va a estar organizada por el Instituto Mora y vamos a tener dos conferencistas, uno es Jax Paul Ramírez Gallegos de Flaxo, sede Ecuador, y el tema será Migración, Estado y Políticas del Control hacia el Enfoque de Derechos, el caso de Ecuador, 
y la otra conferencia estará a cargo de Mariana García de la Universidad Nacional de Rosario, Argentina, y el tema es la nueva normativa migratoria en Argentina, su complejo proceso de sanción, reglamentación y ejecución. Entonces, eh, se les invita cordialmente a que estén presentes en esta novena sesión y muchas gracias por su participación en esta sesión. Gracias, Elmira. Entonces, a todas, las, eh, a todas las sedes que estuvieron con nosotros, también les reiteramos nuestros agradecimientos y ya escucharon la invitación para la pro próxima sesión. And thanks again, Professor Marquides. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.